I believe I our next speaker, uh, I'm very happy to be able to introduce Dr. Rachel Bastianand, who is clinical lead for inherited cardiac conditions at Guy's and St. Thomas's and King's College Hospital. Uh, and she will be providing a talk on, on long QT syndrome and CPVT for us. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Chris. The first thing for me to check is, can you hear me? We can, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. I've had some connection problems today, so let me just share my slides. Lovely, so welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see so many of you here. I've got about 20 minutes now to talk to you about long QT syndrome and CPVT. And I'm pleased to say that probably most of the hard work has already been done by Mark and Michael earlier today in their lovely talks about the ECG phenotypes and tests. So hopefully this will be a little bit of revision for you. The aim of my talk is to, first of all, I'd like to just review the general approach to patients that are referred to our ICC clinics, which hopefully has come up a number of times during the CLIC programme. I'd like to provide you an overview of long QT syndrome and CPVT in terms of the patho pathophysiology, diagnosis and management, and then try to put a bit of this theory into practice through a couple of short clinical cases. So the first thing when we think about patients being referred to our clinics, I think there's a general approach that applies to most and inherited arrhythmia syndrome patients are no different. What we try to do is establish a diagnosis through clinical history, examination findings, family pedigree, ECG imaging and other investigations as appropriate. And you've already heard quite a lot earlier this morning um, from Michael about the different tests we do for inherited arrhythmias. We want to treat patient symptoms through lifestyle, through medication and sometimes through surgical or other forms of intervention. We know that inherited arrhythmia syndromes and other inherited cardiac conditions are associated with risk of sudden death. And so we need to risk stratify to our best ability, which as you've recently heard from Elijah's presentation in Brigada syndrome isn't always easy, but we want to try and work out who are those high risk patients and who should have ICD implantation. If there's a clinical phenotype, then genetic testing is often appropriate, targeted to that clinical phenotype. And then evaluation of the family with inherited conditions. Of course, it's not just the patient in front of us, it's their relatives who may be at risk. And we can clinically evaluate first degree relatives. And if we find a pathogenic variant in the proband, we can use that for cascade screening. Now, I'm going to uh, just show this slide with a few of the more recent guidelines and consensus statements that have been mentioned already today, but that I'll refer to um, during this talk. Essentially, inherited arrhythmia syndromes, we know we've heard already, they're caused by disturbed function of iron channel subunits or the proteins that regulate them. Mark gave us a nice description of that earlier this morning. There are common features, so there's a genetic basis, patients have structurally normal hearts, and there's this predisposition to life-threatening arrhythmia. Now, I am not going to go into detail on this slide, but suffice to say that this is a diagram of a cardiomyocyte showing some of the different proteins and genetic abnormalities that are involved in the pathogenesis of inherited arrhythmia syndromes. So we start with genetic abnormalities and there is often at a molecular level environmental influence. That translates at a cellular level to electrophysiological changes and then to the patient level. So the patient we see in front of us, as we mentioned already, has a structurally normal heart, usually. ECG phenotypes, which may be there at, pre uh, at rest or may need provocation to reveal. And this predisposition to cardiac arrhythmias. So the symptoms that patients 
complain of are similar amongst these conditions. Palpitations, syncope, some of them survive a cardiac arrest, and sadly for some, the first presentation is sudden death. The differences between the different conditions and even different subtypes within these inherited arrhythmia conditions are that there are different triggers. And those triggers for uh, ventricular arrhythmias we'll touch upon when we uh, look at long QT and CPVT. Now, you had a much more detailed, beautiful presentation about uh, the cardiac action potential earlier today from Mark. This is just a brief reminder and a more simplistic way, perhaps, of looking at it, that depolarization of the cell is governed predominantly by inwards movement of sodium ions. Excitation, contraction, coupling and contraction of the cell is governed predominantly by calcium ion influx into the cell, but also release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And repolarization is governed predominantly by outwards movement or efflux of potassium ions from the cell. And those different uh, stages of the action potential translate into the surface ECG changes you see below. I think it's helpful to think about this and again, Mark has mentioned this already today for congenital long QT syndrome. So anything that increases the sodium current or reduces the potassium current can cause QT prolongation. And if we consider just the three principal types of long QT syndrome, we see that those uh, that, that these are the underlying mechanisms. So in long QT type one, we see loss of function in a potassium channel, reduction in that potassium current. You see the characteristic ECG changes here with the broad based peaked T wave and symptoms or arrhythmias that tend to occur on exertion. In long QT2, again, we see a loss of function potassium channel variant with reduction in potassium current and symptoms that tend to occur on auditory stimuli. In long QT3, it's a gain of function sodium channel variant, which increases the sodium current. And here we tend to see symptoms during sleep. And there's good association with pathogenic variants in potassium and sodium channel genes in the majority of patients with long QT syndrome. We've talked already about diagnosis. So this is predominantly governed by the Schwartz score. There's been an evolution, I think, in um, scoring systems and the degree of QT prolongation that's felt to be diagnostic for long QT syndrome. But the diagnosis hinges on QT prolongation, features in the clinical history, features in the family history, and or a confirmed causative pathogenic gene variant. Of course, it's important that those features are seen in the absence of QT prolonging medications or significant electrolyte disturbances. One of the hardest things I think uh, often when we see these patients in clinic is deciding how long the QT interval really is. And that's particularly true of patients who have low voltage T waves. This is a nice little review article which gives you some tips and tricks on how to measure the QT interval. The chosen lead should be lead two whenever possible. We need to ignore the U wave. You've seen illustrations already today of use of the tangent method, where a tangent is drawn uh, at the downslope of the T wave to intersect with that isoelectric line so that you can make this measurement for an accurate QT interval. It's important to correct for heart rate. I think somebody asked about this earlier. Bazitz is traditionally used, but we know that at the extremes of heart rate, Bazitz is less accurate and Friderich's formula may be more accurate, particularly when there's tachycardia. And when there's arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, it's important to average more than one reading. So an average of three is advised. Moving swiftly on to CPVT, this is characterized by unexplained polymorphic ventriculectopy, bidirectional VT, which may lead to torsade and then to ventricular fibrillation. 
Symptoms tend to occur during stress or exertion, and it's associated with pathogenic variants in the genes involved in intracellular calcium handling. So you'll see on the diagram here, the ryanodine receptor and calcioquestrin. On the panel on the right, you'll see a classical treadmill just showing one lead for a patient with CPVT. And with exercise, we start to see ventriculectopy followed by bidirectional couplets, bidirectional VT. And if allowed to continue, you might see that degenerate like the panels on the left to polymorphic VT and VF. Now, it's not always the case that it follows this perfect pattern, but this is the classical description. It's diagnosed in the presence of a normal ECG and structurally normal heart with the findings we've already seen. In first degree relatives of an index case, the diagnosis may be made on exercise induced ectopy, ventricular ectopy, that is, alone. And again, like with long QT syndrome, if there's a confirmed causative pathogenic variant in an appropriate gene, then that can be diagnostic. For both of these conditions, lifestyle plays a part in the management. Long QT syndrome, I think, is probably the one that you may know best about. And there are certain drugs which cause QT prolongation and should therefore be avoided in these patients. This website, CredibleMeds.org, if you don't know about it already, I hope that that's something that you'll take away today because that's a great website that's kept well up to date with lists of medications to avoid. It's important to correct electrolyte abnormalities, particularly low potassiums, low magnesiums. There's advice to avoid genotype specific triggers for arrhythmias. So you'll remember long QT2, it tended to be auditory stimuli and you may advise your patients not to wake up with an alarm clock, but to look for other methods to wake them in the mornings. In general, patients with significant QT prolongation are told to avoid competitive sports, but there have been recent guidelines from the ESC 2020, where patients with lesser degrees of QT prolongation or those who carry genes but without the phenotype, so gene genetic abnormalities but with normal QT intervals, it may be uh, the, the guidelines have become more liberal for their sporting activity, although shared decision making with those patients is important. In CPVT, patients should avoid competitive sports and strenuous exercise. They should avoid stimulant medications and drugs, including energy drinks, and ideally limit stressful situations, although I think we all know that that may or may not be possible throughout our lifetimes. The mainstay of treatment for both of these conditions is beta blocker therapy, and Nadalol is the first line beta blocker for both. This can present problems at times because there have been issues in supply chains with get, getting Nadalol medication for patients. And there are certainly still uh, some way to go in certain areas to ensure that GPs are happy to prescribe the drug. As well as beta blocker therapy in long QT3, mixilatine can be considered for those patients who have significant QT prolongation. That's a sodium channel blocker. And as you remember, long QT3 is a sodium channel pathogenic variant based disease. In CPVT, flaconide can be used as an add on, as an adjunct for the patients who still get symptoms despite beta blocker therapy. Left cardiac sympathetic denervation is also a treatment option for these patients. That's for patients with long QT or CPVT, those who are intolerant of beta blockers, those who have symptoms despite treatment, or those who are higher risk and were offered ICDs but refused for whatever reason. The images on the slide show images from a procedure which is usually performed using video assisted thoracoscopy. There's removal of the lower half of the left stellate ganglion and the first four thoracic ganglia. This interrupts the release of noradrenaline from the left cardiac sympathetic nerves. And the effect of that is to increase the threshold for ventricular fibrillation. So although we may still see ventricular tachycardia, it's less likely to degenerate into VF. 
Of course, as with any invasive procedure, there are complications such as Horneth syndrome, pneumothorax, and even the potential for refractory ventricular arrhythmia. ICDs for patients would be recommended for all of those who survive a cardiac arrest. They are also recommended to be considered or offered to patients who have recurrent symptoms, so recurrent syncope, recurrent ventricular arrhythmia, despite medical therapy. There's a slight growing potential caveat to CPVT and the ICD in that inappropriate shocks in this patient group have been shown to occasionally, unfortunately, trigger VT or VF storm, which in some cases has been refractory to further treatments. And so I think particularly for patients with CPVT, we have to be very careful when we're thinking about ICD placement. And with all of these patients, often they're young and the potential for device related complications in patients who are going to have a device implanted at a young age and live with it for a long period of time, of course, are greater. And I know we're going to talk more about ICDs and devices in our next couple of talks, but I think it's always worth bearing in mind um, the, the potential for complications in these young patients. Now, I'd like to finish quickly with a couple of clinical cases. This is an 18 year old lady who presented to the emergency department with syncope 12 weeks after having a baby. She'd recently been treated with erythromycin for a chest infection. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And there was no real family history of note, but there was some family history of unexplained blackouts. And I hope that you will agree with me that her QT interval on this ECG looks long. Perhaps similar to the one Michael showed earlier, the uh, computer doesn't necessarily agree and I think has recorded it as being somewhere like 460. So it's very important to measure the QT intervals yourself and not just rely on the machines. She had a further syncopal episode in A&E, and this is what was recorded on the cardiac monitor. So evidence of polymorphic VT or torsade. And these patients should be treated with cardioversion, of course, if required. We need to remove the QT prolonging drugs. Here, that's erythromycin. We need to supplement electrolytes, so magnesium and potassium, particularly to the high normal range. Overdrive pacing isoprenaline can be used if there's further ventricular arrhythmia. Beta blocker therapy should be started as soon as possible. And this lady was subsequently diagnosed with congenital long QT type 2. And we know that in long QT type 2, the at risk period often for, for women is that postpartum period. I have one other case a 17 year old boy who collapsed in a nightclub. He was resuscitated from a VF arrest. And that's on that occasion, he'd been drinking alcohol, but no stimulants or other drugs, no past medical history of note, and a family history of epilepsy, which of course can wave a few red flags for us. This was his ECG soon after his cardiac arrest. He had blood tests, those were normal, including the electrolytes and the toxicology. Cardiac imaging showed normal cardiac structure and function. At that time, there was no exercise test done and no halter monitoring, and he was diagnosed with long QT syndrome on the basis of this ECG soon after his arrest, and an ICD was implanted. He was lost to follow up for a few years and reappeared five years later with his ICD not on any medications. And this was his ECG in the clinic. And I think you will. I hope agree that the QT interval there looks pretty normal. Reviewing his prior history, he reported episodes of exertion, uh, yes, of exertional syncope as a child. And because during those episodes there'd been some witness shaking movements, and probably because of the family history of epilepsy, he'd been referred to a neur neurologist. But his investigations for epilepsy showed nothing. And although at that time cardiology referral was suggested, it wasn't made. Cardiac imaging still showed normal structure and function, and the ICD check was pretty unremarkable. This is his treadmill at stage three, 
And by stage four, I hope that you will agree that here we see a bidirectional couplet. So the next thing we went on to do was look at the family and to consider genetic testing. This is his family pedigree. This is him. Mum's side of the family, pretty unremarkable. Mum and her brother, asymptomatic. Dad's side of the family had this suspicious history of epilepsy. And we know that epilepsy can be a misdiagnosis in patients who have cardiac syncope um, or syncope due to cardiac arrhythmia because there can be some uh, uh, epileptic like movements noted at the time of syncope. Unfortunately, there was no contact with dad and his side of the family, which of course made family screening problematic. Genetic testing, the proband, found a variant of unknown significance in the ranadine receptor, which would be in keeping, of course, with his clinical CPVT phenotype. But the variant at this stage was of unknown significance. So we did see mum in the clinic. She's asymptomatic with no past medical history of notes and her resting ECG, I think you'll agree, looks pretty normal. Her echo was normal. But on the treadmill, she also developed bidirectional couplets. And the same ranadine uh, receptor variant was identified. Her brother was also found to have a similar clinical phenotype and the same variant. And that variant was therefore found to be co-segregating with the disease. All three of them, I'm pleased to say, or at least the last term I know, knew were well controlled on beta blocker therapy. And the diagnosis here is actually CPVT. That QT prolongation was seen immediately after the arrest and not subsequently. Thank you all for listening and um, I have finished there. So thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rachel. That's a really uh, great uh, overview of long QT and CPVT with some lovely cases uh, at the end. Thank you very much.